Casey is a uh, Wisconsin DNR fisheries biologist uh, in the Baldwin office, correct? <laughs> I hope that's right. Uh, she's going to be talking about yes. the trout population response to mechanical removal of brown trout. So I see your presentation, Casey. Awesome. Can you hear me okay? I can. Perfect. Great. Take it away. Okay, so um, yeah, thanks for the introduction um, here early on Monday morning. Um, I'm going to talk about um, several projects that we have going on in Katy Creek in Pierce County um, that are in the interest of restoring or um, maintaining the brook trout population that we have in this stream. Um, so I cover, um, like Sarah said, uh, St. Croix Pierce and Western Dunn counties located in the far northern part of the Driftless area in Wisconsin. Let's see here. Oh, here we go. Okay, so first off, I just want to thank my crew um, for all of our hard work on this project and many others, um, Brian Spangler, Dustin Scherer, and Sam Jacobson. Um, they've really been a big help uh, with this project. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into it in the interest of time. Um, so as most of you know, um, the trout species that we have here in the Driftless area um, are brook trout and brown trout. Um, we have a little bit of limited rainbow trout stocking throughout the Driftless area, um, but brook trout are only inland native trout species. Um, brown trout um, are present in many streams and they were introduced from Europe decades ago um, and we still manage for both species um, and they're very important um, fisheries um, in these streams and we stock um, both of these species as well in many streams. Um, so just a very quick background, um, many streams in the Driftless area have experienced some pretty dramatic changes in species assemblage as far as trout species go. Um, some streams that were once 100% brook trout streams or brook trout dominated um, have kind of flipped or switched to um, brown trout dominated streams. Um, and in um, some cases, brook trout um, are only existent now at very low abundances. Um, just to give you a few examples of streams where this has occurred, um, this is just a, a short list, not a complete list um, of streams in my management area and um, streams down in the La Crosse area, um, as well as the Black River Falls area where um, this has occurred, where once um, brook trout dominated streams um, have flipped to uh, now brown trout dominated streams. Um, so why is this happening? Why are we seeing brook trout decline and brown trout um, densities increase in these streams? Um, so it could be due to many factors um, and many factors may be interacting together to cause these changes or to allow for these changes to happen. Um, so the first one, um, temperature changes or temperature increases um, due to climate change um, and a warming climate, um, brown trout, um, have the ability to tolerate a little bit higher water temperatures than brook trout. Um, brook trout are a little bit more sensitive to increasing or higher water temperatures. Um, so that could be a factor playing a role here. Um, also habitat changes is another possibility. Um, in uh, the Driftless area, um, typical habitat projects um, in the past have tended to favor brown trout, specifically adult brown trout. Um, and some of these projects have kind of led to this species change um, in several of these streams. Um, also stocking changes um, or changes in stocking within a watershed or a stream um, can lead to these changes. And I'm gonna talk about that specifically um, here in a few slides. Um, that's happened within um, the O'Galley River um, and several tributaries to the O'Galley River. Um, and also disturbance, um, which could be any of the above. Um, so brown trout are likely better adapted to tolerate disturbances. And these disturbances could include, you know, temperature, changes in habitat, um, that kind of thing. So I'm just going to touch on um, a little bit of a case study. Um, that occurred in Pine Creek, um, which is located in uh, southeastern Pierce County. Um, and this stream had um, several miles of habitat improvement 
um, done on it in the early 2000s. Um, and previously the stream was um, basically a complete brook trout stream, 100% brook trout. Um, brown trout were non-existent. Um, and so a habitat project was conducted for several years um, on this stream. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this project. Um, and this is just Kent Johnson. Um, this is some of his data that he um, evaluated from the results of that project. Um, so there were several objectives to this project. Um, the first that I didn't list here was obviously to um, increase or improve brook trout densities and natural reproduction. Um, but their, their first objective was to improve the stream temperature regime um, and provide a buffer against future climate change impacts. Um, so that was our first objective and that objective was met. Um, Pine Creek is a very, very cold stream. Um, it has a ton of spring influence. Um, it's definitely the coldest stream within my management area. And this project um, basically resulted in an even colder stream temperature regime. Um, their second objective was to reduce um, stream bank height, reduce erosion, um, and reconnect the stream to the floodplain, um, which um, did happen after the project was completed. Um, objective number three was to um, increase the coarse substrate um, within the stream. And then their fourth objective was to increase aquatic macrophyte presence, um, which also was achieved by the um, removal of trees and opening up the canopy. And then also um, uh, reducing the stream channel width by narrowing up the stream and increase the water depth. So all of these objectives were met. Um, however, um, with in or reducing the cold water or improving the cold water temperature regime in Pine Creek, um, that alone did not provide a competitive advantage um, post restoration for brook trout. So as you'll see on this graph, um, this kind of shows the timeline um, of uh, brook trout and brown trout densities um, and uh, the habitat restoration work when that began. So I've got um, number per mile, so catch rates of brook trout and brown trout on the y-axis. Um, and then this is at one of our trend sites that we survey annually. So from the year 2000 to 2023, um, brook trout and brown trout densities in Pine Creek. Um, brook trout is the green line and brown trout is the brown line. Um, so you can see prior to the habitat project, which is um, that red arrow, um, brook trout were present in pretty high densities already, um, you know, two to 4,000 per mile. Um, and after the project began, you can see brown trout um, did show up. They were in present in very low densities um, at the beginning of the project. And then you can see brook trout um, increased initially after the project was completed. And then as brown trout began to increase in density, brook trout simultaneously declined. Um, and then around the year 2013, um, if you can see my cursors, when brown trout um, surpassed brook trout densities and from there increased pretty dramatically, even in 2021, uh, brown trout were uh, present over 10,000 fish per mile, which is extremely high. And now currently br brook trout exists at very low density densities at a couple hundred per mile. Um, they did attempt a brown trout removal for two years, um, wasn't successful. Um, it definitely needed to, to go on longer than that two years and it wasn't for the entire length of the stream. Um, so you can see after this project, um, you know, we, we observed this species flip basically, um, even though we had really good temperature regimes. So um, likely the disturbance of the habitat work um, and maybe some other factors that we're unaware of led to this species shift in Pine Creek. So moving on to Katy Creek, which is gonna be the focus of my talk. Um, so Katy Creek is located just north of Pine Creek in Northeastern Dunn County. Um, you can see here, um, it flows down from St. Croix County. The watershed does um, down into Pierce County. Um, so the red line here um, or the red polygon on the right um, map um, is the O'Galley River watershed. Um, so the O'Galley River starts up in um, southern St. Croix County in Spring Valley, um, flows down into Pierce County 
and then enters the Chippewa River in Dunn County. And um, Katy Creek is the green line um, flowing from the north down into Elmwood where it enters the Ogalley River. So why, why is Katy Creek so important and why are these brook trout in Katy Creek um, you know, so important for us to maintain um, or conserve um, specifically. So um, Katy Creek is a class one tributary to the Ogalley River. The class one status just indicates um, that there is plenty of natural reproduction to sustain the fishery and uh, trout are present in densities to occupy available habitat. So they're kind of the best of the best streams. Um, Katy Creek's also an exceptional resource water has great water quality, um, and it's one of the few uh, or the last brook trout fisheries left in Pierce County that's of a fishable size anyways. Um, the brook trout in Katy Creek have also been genetically tested and um, shown to be uh, the result of the wild heritage strain of brook trout, just meaning that they haven't been influenced by hatchery genetics in the past. Um, and historically, Katy Creek has, has had very high densities of brook trout, and um, those densities are still present in um, the upper reaches or the headwaters of the stream. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's had almost five miles of intensive habitat work completed on it um, early, in the early 2000s, so we have a lot of investment in this stream. Um, because of its um, great genetics, it's also on our broodstock collection rotation for our hatcheries. Um, so every five years, hatchery staff come and collect eggs from Katy Creek and use those to propagate and stock around uh, the state. And Katy Creek is also um, listed as a brook trout reserve stream, um, just meaning that it um, likely has the potential to maintain brook trout into the future um, under a warming climate scenario. So um, just a little bit of past management on Katy Creek and kind of the background of um, why, why we're doing the things that we're doing and what's happening in Katy. So prior to 2005, um, brown trout were stocked in the Ogalley River annually. Um, and these fish that were stocked were the domestic strain of brown trout. Um, so that's kind of key. I try to remember that. And then in 2005, um, the strain of those brown trout stocked into the Ogalley River, that strain was changed from domestic to the timber coolie strain, um, which is more of a wild strain. Um, the eggs um, from this strain of trout are collected down near the Little Cross region. Um, and they're more of the wild strain that, you know, hasn't been raised in a hatchery for year after year after year. Um, so these timber coolies were stocked in the Ogalley River after 2005, and they were also stocked near the confluence of Katy. Um, in 2007, um, two years after that stocking change, um, two six to seven inch brown trout were captured in Katy Creek during surveys. So those are the first two documented brown trout in Katy Creek. Um, soon after that, brown trout increased to over a thousand fish per mile in trend sites in by 2018, um, and there were much higher densities downstream of this trend site. So this graph um, just basically illustrates um, what I just mentioned. So we've got catch rates, or fish per mile on the y-axis, and then um, data back um, to 1984 to 2021. Um, brook trout, once again, is the green line, and brown trout are the brown. Um, and I mentioned that habitat work was done on Katy, and that was in the early 2000s. You can see that in the shaded box. And then the red line is when feral brown trout stocking began in the Ogalley River. Um, you can see brook trout, very high densities, and brown trout down here. They really started to increase in densities um, around 2010, 2011, and brook trout simultaneously declined um, from that point on. So in 2019, um, we um, conducted a rotation survey on Katy Creek, um, just meaning that we survey um, more sites than we normally would in addition to our trend sites, um, survey it more comprehensively. This is fish per mile again, but on um, the x-axis, I have each site that we surveyed on Katy Creek. So um, on the left side of the graph um, is the upstream portion of the stream moving downstream to site one, which is closer to the confluence of the Ogalley River. Um, so you can see here, brook trout um, are the green line once again, 
um, in the headwaters or the upper reaches of Katy Creek, we have still high densities of brook trout and very few brown trout. And then as you move downstream to, as you get closer to the O'Galley River, um, things kind of flip and we have higher brown trout densities than brook trout. And this was in 2019. Um, so because of this and because we um, kind of observed what happened in Pine Creek, um, we didn't want that to happen in Katy Creek too. And we have a little bit um, better chance of of changing things or maintaining the brook trout population in Katy Creek than Pine Creek, just because it's not that far along. Um, so um, I started off with stop stocking brown trout into the O'Galley River first. Um, so that was kind of an obvious change that needed to be made. Um, I initiated brook trout stocking in 2020, um, started stocking feral brook trout into the O'Galley River um, and no brown trout stocking from that point forward. Um, I also worked to change um, the fishing regulations in Katy Creek to allow for increased harvest of brown trout and to protect brook trout. Um, so currently, um, starting this year, um, anglers can keep five brown trout, no minimum size limit, and all brook trout much, must be released. Um, so in addition to those two changes, um, we also initiated um, mechanical brown trout removal using our electrofishing gear. Um, and also within the, well, this was last year, was our first year to develop um, a temporary fish barrier. Um, we looked at options um, to um, develop a more permanent fish barrier to um, prevent brown trout from moving into Katy Creek from the O'Galley River, but it just wasn't possible with the gradient um, of lower Katy Creek. Um, it just would have backed up water for um, a very long distance, which just wasn't feasible. Um, and in addition to that, we um, did a wild fish transfer um, from high density areas to low density areas. So that upstream area where there's still high densities of brook trout, we actually moved some of those downstream um, to try to boost the population um, within the downstream area that was affected by the brown trout, um, brown trout uh, movement into the stream. Um, so we had very low densities of brook trout there and we tried to boost that population back up. Um, so part one of this process was the removals. Um, so we began in 2018. Um, we started off with two days um, of sampling or removal. And then um, we kind of increased from there. Um, 2020, we were only able to use backpack shockers um, just because we had to maintain distance between our, our other staff. Um, and we actually did three days of sampling or three days um, with five sampling events. And during all of these years, we donated the trout that we removed to a local nursing home. Um, we weren't able to move them to a different stream um, just because of uh, disease transfer um, issues. Um, so we had to remove these fish permanently. Um, in 2021, 22, and 23, um, we increased our sampling quite a bit um, and tried to cover as much of the stream as we could. Um, and we donated the trout collected during these years to a wildlife rehab center. So this graph um, on the left-hand side on the y-axis um, is the num actual number of brown trout removed. Um, then we've got the year on the y, and then on the right side um, is the miles of stream that we conducted these removals. Um, so the, the gray bars are the total trout removed and then the number of miles um, are the dots. So you can see 2021 was a crazy year. It was a hard year to deal with. We had a huge, huge year, year classes of fish produced in 2020 and 2021. So most of these fish represented in um, 2021 were either age zero or age one fish. Um, it um, There's just have very high densities of both brooks um, and brown trout throughout our um, our management area that year. Um, and after that, you can see um, the number of brown trout um, that we removed really dropped off with our um, one of our lowest year yet, years yet in 2023, um, which is really encouraging. Um, in the past several years, we've been removing brown trout from anywhere from four and a half to six miles um, of Katy Creek. So this is just 
kind of a similar graph, just breaking down um, the brown trout removed into different um, size classes or age classes. Um, so the young of year is the blue line. Um, so this is anything less than five and a half inches um, or juvenile trout. And then adults are the red line and total is the green. And then the number of miles removed is that yellow line you can see up there. So even with um, the higher or um, more miles of stream that we removed fish from, you can see from 2021 to 2023, um, brown trout um, densities um, are just dropping um, continuously with one of our lowest years, like I said, in 2023, which is really encouraging. Um, and we're not having as many brown trout move in and not as much uh, brown trout naturally production as um, there were when we um, initiated this project. So this is kind of the results so far um, and the brook trout response to this. So catch rates again on the y-axis um, of both brook and brown trout. Brook are the green, brown trout are the brown. Um, and you can see here um, since about 2019, brook trout have um, kind of turned around and started to increase back up. Um, and brown trout within the past couple of years um, have started to decline with a really um, kind of dramatic decline from 2022 to 2023, which is really encouraging. So um, brown trout last year um, during our removals were only about uh, 300 fish per mile, um, which makes our job a lot easier. Um, we're not having to remove that many fish because it is a labor intensive process. Um, we're continuously shocking, um, you know, five to six miles of stream. So um, it's great to see and the brook trout response has been um, really encouraging as well. Um, but despite the success of these removals so far, we still have an influx of brown trout in the fall um, that are trying to spawn in Katy Creek that are moving into Katy from the O'Galley. Um, so basically Katy Creek is acting as a spawning rearing and nursery stream for brown trout from the O'Galley River. So we do need some kind of barrier here to prevent um, this movement. Um, needs to be temporary and we um, basically need to determine it specifically where on the stream to install this barrier. So last year for the first time, I was able to get a weir or part of a weir from um, Peshtigo from the east side of the state. Um, and we installed it in Katy Creek in October for a week or two. Um, so this is what it looked like. It's got a trap in the middle. I've got this image here. This is from Oregon. Um, it just shows how it's supposed to work a little bit better. Um, so as fish migrate upstream, they, um, they hit these barriers and it forces them into the middle um, and the box. Um, that you can see here behind this gentleman is the trap. So fish will swim in here, um, they get caught, and then um, you can open this up and um, basically remove any fish that you want or pass fish upstream um, if you want to. So that's the goal in Katie is, um, and that's what our, our trap was designed to do as well. So um, there's some pros and cons to this. Um, it prevented fish movement upstream into Katie Creek um, which was great. It was easy to install. We had really easy access. We had a landowner um, that we have an easement on, um, let us drive right down to the stream. Um, and we can allow brook trout to pass upstream with this with this type of situation. The cons for this first year was kind of the, the maiden voyage. Um, we were just experimenting with it. Um, we didn't trap any fish. So we've got some problems with our trap. Um, so we need to adjust that. Um, it needed, the weir itself needed to be cleaned or checked a couple times a day. We have leaf fall going on um, and you've got to clean that off or else um, you're going to back water up quite a bit um, upstream of the trap or upstream of the weir. Um, increase in travel time, increase in staff time and the timing of the install were all things that we, we kind of needed to work on and figure out a little bit more. So we've got to alter our trap and our funnel so we can actually trap brown trout um, and to do this, we really need to understand the exact timing of brown trout movement in the fall um, and other times of the year as well. So to do this and to help with our removal and our barrier on Katy Creek, we developed um, a trout movement study. And to do this, we collaborated um, with research staff. Um, so 
to do this, um, we used PIT tags or passive integrated transponder tags um, that can allow us to track the movement of individual fish. Um, so the picture here, if you're not familiar, um, this is also basically the same thing as a microchip in a cat or dog. Um, so it has an individual number and you can link that back to the specific fish. Um, so um, to track fish, um, in addition to um, when we're out electrofishing and we encounter tagged fish, we have a scanner and we can scan the fish and um, um, get some movement data that way. But also um, we installed with um, research staff's help, um, installed two arrays um, in Katy Creek um, above and below, below a beaver dam. So um, Matt Mitro, um, the research scientist out of Madison, um, he um, wanted to evaluate trout movement or passage through beaver dams. Um, so this was kind of a great opportunity where he could evaluate that and where we could evaluate um, seasonal movement um, of trout um, in the O'Galley River watershed. So it's kind of a two-part study. I'm just going to talk about the seasonal movement and I don't have a lot of data to share, but this is kind of a kind of what we're doing and what we're looking at right now. Um, so this is the array. And basically, we set this up, research staff did, we just helped them. Um, and you can see these wires um, um, above the level of the stream. And um, also, there's a wire that um, is uh, just above the substrate, and those sandbags are kind of keeping it down. So anytime a fish passes through there, this array will detect um, that individual fish pit tag number. Um, and record the time and the date that the fish passed through. And we've got two of these arrays set up above and below a beaver dam. So we can see um, if trout are passing through the beaver dam and we can also get directional movement um, so we can determine if they're moving upstream or downstream. So um, we've got our arrays in place, but we've got to tag trout in order to um, see when and where they're going. Um, so to do this, we um, tagged trout throughout the um, part of the O'Galley River and um, lower Katy Creek, which um, resulted in three and a half miles of stream that we tagged trout in. So um, the confluence of the of Katy Creek and the O'Galley River is located here, um, and the yellow line represents the portion of stream where we tagged trout in. Um, and then the arrays and the beaver dams are located here, that second red arrow. Um, so we were just basically um, assuming that fish within this portion of the O'Galley River were likely to migrate up into Katy Creek um, for spawning purposes in the fall. Um, and then I, uh, we also tagged both brook and brown trout. And we ended up with a little over a thousand fish tagged with these pit tags, um, mostly brown trout, about 743 brown trout and 272 brook trout were tagged. We inserted these tags into the body cavity and um, externally we marked brown trout by adipose um, or clipping their adipose fin. And then the brook trout um, were marked with a yellow elastomer tag on their pectoral fin. So we could um, kind of determine tag loss on these fish. Um, whereas if we catch the fish and we see these external markers, um, and we don't detect a pit tag, we know that that fish likely lost its pit tag. Um, so this is just a picture of one of the beaver dams here um, that we that Matt's evaluating a passage through. Um, so basically from our, our seasonal movement study, the part that um, I wanted to look at um, so that we could install our weir at a certain time to prevent fish movement. Um, so we were, we're hopefully going to be able to evaluate the seasonal movement of brook and brown trout. We can also evaluate tributary use. Um, and then Matt can evaluate the differences between brook and brown trout passage through beaver dams. And we can also look at um, growth of trout um, through our recapture events because we know how long the fish was when we tagged it and how long it is um, when we recapture it. So we can evaluate growth as well as um, habitat use. Um, so I don't um, unfortunately, have any data to share with our trout movement study yet. We just um, uh, have the data from the arrays um, 
from this past fall. Um, so we haven't got to analyze that yet. So that's um, coming in the future. Um, but we do plan to continue our brown trout removals. Um, we also plan to monitor the response of the brook trout population by continuing our trend site monitoring. Um, and we also plan to continue our brook trout stocking in the Ogallee River. Um, and then, um, like I said, we'll be able to analyze our trout movement data um, and install the weir according to um, the time when most brown trout are mo moving into Katy Creek in the fall for spawning. Um, and I just want to thank my crew again, thank Matt Mitro and all of his staff um, and my supervisor again for all the support. And with that, I can take any questions. We had a question asking whether browns outcompete brook trout because of the size or growth advantages or because of a having a head start in their hatching or something else. Can you speak a little bit to? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, in general, brown trout grow faster. They reach larger sizes. Um, they're, they're a little bit more um, tolerant of disturbances and um, maybe a little bit uh, more degraded conditions in some instances, um, but I think they're in general just a little bit more aggressive and because of their fast growth rates and um, larger body size, they're just able to outcompete brook trout for, you know, um, resting and foraging areas and just like optimal habitat because of those characteristics. We also had someone ask about whether or not, um, I guess, what what extent you think that habitat improvement uh, is driving the cause for decreases or if there are other drivers as well and if there if it might be effective to change the type of habitat improvements that are being done yeah definitely that it definitely played a role because we had you know four to five miles of habitat were completed on katie um right around right before um, brown trout started showing up. So the stocking and the habitat work likely led to these changes because where we saw the the biggest increases in brown trout were within those habitat project areas. Um, so that that habitat type definitely favored brown trout. Um, so we've been working really hard to kind of adjust our techniques um, of our habitat projects to promote or favor brook trout a little bit more. So we've got a couple of sites that we've been experimenting with some different techniques to try to favor those. And, um, and so far um, we've seen a couple of those projects um, actually maintain brook trout densities rather than them declining, which is a step in the right direction. But um, their habitat preferences are, while they're, they're different, they're pretty similar. So it's kind of hard to tease that apart right now, but we're working on it. Sure thing. Um, we had a question whether or not the your temporary barrier required a chapter 30 permit or some other kind of permit um, to install it. Yeah, good question. Um, we did not have to get a um, any kind of permit that year, just because it was temporary. Um, we only had it in there for a week. Um, if we do have it in there any longer, I, I do anticipate having to apply for a permit for a chapter 30 permit for that. Do you have, it looks like I can ask a couple more. Do you have a type of habitat technique that the Browns you think were favoring over brook trout? Um, I think it has a lot to do with um, the amount of narrowing um, that's done on a lot of the projects, stream narrowing, um, just making that really um, narrow, deep, fast kind of run um, channel that really favors adult brown trout habitat. And um, in addition to that, the lunker structures, that overhead cover brown trout really tend to dominate that that type of habitat. Um, so we've kind of um, been experimenting with a lot less narrowing, um, which kind of allows for the stream to move a little bit more within that channel that we create, um, as well as like getting in some island complexes. So we've got some side channels so the brook trout aren't just having to compete with brown trout for, you know, that one deep, fast channel. Um, that's kind of very basic, kind of what we've been doing, just less stream narrowing, um, which allows more fine substrate to stay within the project sites, um, a lot more complex woody habitat too that we've been implementing to try to favor brook trout. And thanks so much, Casey. Yeah, for sure.